Welcome to Mead Making 301. We are back with more information on how to make better meads and hopefully just how to understand the mead making process better. We've been through Mead Making 101, 201. We're now on 301. And there are two episodes after this, 401 and 501, that you can also find. In the first two episodes of this, we, like episode one was breaking down mead. What is it? The bare bones of mead making in general. Some equipment, stuff like that. The next one talked about the mead making process itself, some extra steps, stuff like halting fermentation and some other things. And mead 301, we're talking about the following topics. Back sweetening mead, carbonating your mead, aging said mead, and oaking your mead. Now I have some notes right here that I am referencing that I have created for you. These are uh, digitally available in a link below. I have really notes for all of these episodes, 101 through 501. So if you would like the Grandmaster 101 to 501 file, it'll be there as well. This just helps you if you're more visual. I'm gonna talk through most of these points, but visual people might want this, or if you just don't wanna watch the video and wanna read, there you go. So let's go ahead and dive into our first topic. Our topic number one is back sweetening mead. Most of the time when we make mead, if you're using normal yeast, it's going to go dry. That's what we call it, where all the sugar is consumed. When mead goes dry, it can still taste very good. However, you can sometimes lose some of the, well, sweetness, obviously, but secondly, some of the honey character, depending on how strong your honey was, and so on and so forth. Or you might just not like dry mead and so you want something sweeter. So back sweetening is a pretty simple process, but it needs to be done properly. So let's talk about the ways to actually back sweeten it without running any risk of hurting yourself or someone else in the process. Cause that's very possible if you do it completely wrong. So there are really like two ways to do this. There's the process of making a mead, letting it go completely dry halting the fermentation or stopping any future fermentation and then back sweetening or the other process or other side would be to cap out your yeast, meaning you put so much sugar in the brew in the start that they can't eat it all and they leave some sugar at the end. So let's talk about the first one. I'm gonna use some specific gravity readings. I'm assuming or hoping that you know what those are at this point to help us navigate these waters. Let's assume that we started at 1.070 starting gravity. We put our hydrometer in, we got that number, and we have our starting gravity. After the fermentation is done at 1.000, we are now able to put stuff in to halt future fermentation or to actually just kill off the yeast. So for us to do that, we either have to use potassium sorbate and potassium metabisulfite, which are two things we use in conjunction that will basically halt the yeast from further fermenting in the future, allowing us to use fermentable back sweetening sugar. The other way is to pasteurize. Pasteurizing is the process of heating the liquid up and killing off the yeast subsequently. Now, before we get too far, let me talk about the potassium sorbate metabisulfite. I use this method a lot. Some people don't wanna use those things and that's fine. They're pretty easy to throw into a brew and they will literally halt the fermentation. Sorbate is a neutralizer. It stabilizes the yeast. It, it says, it well, makes them go dormant, essentially. The metabisulfite draws out any oxygen, which they need whenever they're trying to bud and reproduce, which is partially how they end up making a bigger yeast colony. So the combination of those halts the future fermentation. At that point, once those are put into the brew, you wait about 24 hours and you can use any fermentable sugar, honey, regular sugar, uh, brown sugar, whatever is fermentable. Those are all fermentable examples. If you were to pasteurize your brew and you wanted it to be sweet, an important factor here is you must back sweeten the brew first to your level that you want and then pasteurize, meaning you add your honey in, your fermentation finished at 1.000, you add your honey into this brew now to the level you want, and then you pasteurize. This is because there are wild yeast in most honey that can kick up, and if they're strong enough, they could actually kickstart fermentation again if you don't 
or if you do it inverse. If you pasteurize and then back sweeten, they could just kick up and start the party again. But if you back sweeten and then pasteurize, it's a little bit different. So back sweeten, pasteurize if you do it that order. Both of those methods will ensure that there is no more yeast activity on your back sweetened sugar. You wanna also make sure your uh, stabilizers that we use are not old. So if they're over a year old, sometimes they can go bad and they don't work as well. The other side is to cap out your yeast. Essentially you add so much honey to this brew that the yeast can't consume it all. The way you figure this out is you have to look at your yeast individually and say, what is their alcohol by volume tolerance? Let's say it's 14%. You then have to run the numbers to say, well, I need my starting gravity to go over 14% and hope that the yeast will actually stop. I say hope because yeast can strong arm their way through their cap if they're healthy. So don't be surprised if your 14% yeast stops at 14.5 or 15%. That just happens sometimes. So capping out the yeast, leaving the sugar in there, that's a way to do it, or pasteurize slash stabilize. You can also, the, the, I'll say the third method you could do would be to halt the fermentation via pasteurizing. Let's say you're going along, we started at 1.070 and we got to 1.020. The only way to truly halt fermentation is to literally pasteurize it in that moment. And that will kill off the yeast and they'll all fall to the bottom. I have never really wanted to do this. I don't love pasteurizing. It can be dangerous if you don't do it right or correctly. Here are the times and temperatures on screen. Please don't hurt yourself. Do it in a way that's not gonna hurt you, hurt you or someone else. On that note, if you don't stabilize or pasteurize and your yeast can continue to ferment, they will continue to ferment. This is especially important if you put it into a bottle and they start re-fermenting again, they're gonna create the CO2 in the bottle and it's trapped in there. And if it's enough CO2 pressure, it will literally blow a bottle up and you'll hurt somebody or yourself. So please make sure you know how to back sweeten safely. Let's move on to topic two which is carbonating your mead. I love carbonated mead. This is a carbonated mead right here. It was really easy to make and there are two methods, two forks we can go in how to carbonate mead. You can either force carbonate it or you can bottle carbonate it. They require different methods, so we'll kind of break them down. Let's talk about the bottle carbonation because this one takes a little more math. In order to bottle carbonate, you're gonna to need to make sure your yeast are still alive. So let's pretend our 1.070 starting gravity brew is at 1.000. If the yeast can still consume sugar, which at that point, most yeast will still be able to consume some sugar, you're in a great spot. Because what you're gonna do now, you're going to add priming sugar to the brew. It comes in all of these forms, as you see on screen. However you do it, use a calculator, a priming sugar calculator to figure out how much to add. You add that into the brew and then you bottle it. The yeast are still alive. Priming sugar is fermentable. So what they do is they kick up fermentation again, like we just talked about with the back sweetening dangers. Because we've used a appropriate amount of priming sugar, we're not concerned about it totally exploding because we've used the correct amount if you used a calculator. In the bottle, those yeast eat the priming sugar, create CO2, a little more alcohol as well. About two weeks will go by and you'll have yourself a carbonated bottle or a bottle carbonated brew. What I normally do with mine is about a week after I have put my priming sugar in and left them in bottles, I'll go ahead and throw one into my fridge, let it sit there for a couple hours and open it and just see how that's going, see if it's carving okay. If you put too much priming sugar in, you'll notice that that carbonation level will probably be too high. If the carbonation level's too high and it starts flying, you need to put those bottles into the fridge immediately because this will essentially make the yeast stop what they're doing, stop the process, because you've added too much priming sugar. That's another example of too much priming sugar equals bottle bombs. So using an, a calculator, priming sugar calculator, will save you a lot of heartache. So that's bottle carbonating. I have a whole video on it. If you wanna go deeper, a little more in depth, it's right there. 
The other side is kegging or force carbonating. I personally do this a lot because it gives me more control of my brews. Going back to our 1.070 starting gravity brew, it's now at 1.000. I'm gonna go through the process of stabilizing and halting fermentation because I personally like to use honey to back sweeten my mead. It gives more mead character. It often helps the fruit character I add or whatever else is there. So pasteurizing or stabilizing will basically say, all right, yeast, you can't consume any more sugar. Back sweeten with my honey. At that point, we're gonna go ahead and essentially just throw it into a keg. Kegs come in many forms and fashions. You don't have to have a ton of equipment to do a kegged or forced carbonated mead recipe. They come in one gallons as well. I'll put some links below. When you put the mead into the keg, you're going to add CO2 on top of it or pressurize the keg. Normally we do it at like 20 to 30 PSI for anywhere from two to three days. That's a general rule of thumb. You can go low and do like 10 PSI for like two weeks, that can work. Really, you just need to have it at a level where it's going to add enough pressure. Once the time goes by for you to pressurize it, you can either hook it up to a kegging system if you have it for taps, or you can use the one gallon tap handle essentially and pour yourself some brews. I highly recommend to pour them cold because they'll pour better, the CO2 will stay in solution better, and it will dissipate slower. If you do a warm pour of a carbonated brew, often it will, CO2 will gas out really fast. I do have a video on kegging if you would like to know more about that, but that's how you carbonate mead. Topic number three, how do we age our mead? This is a pretty easy one actually. If your mead is bottled, that's the easiest way to, to age it, generally speaking, because you just put those bottles away in a kind of dark location that is controlled, temperature controlled. Not necessarily like super cold, but you want it to be like your ambient house temp, you know, maybe if it's lower, if you can do that. You don't wanna put bottles in the garage, in the attic, in somewhere where they're gonna get real hot or really cold. You don't want them to freeze, you don't want them to get hot because that's gonna mess up your mead aging. If it's at a nice temp, it'll age better. You leave them in bottles, put them away, and you forget about them. Other ways to age mead, you can do it in the carboys if you have them or anything like that. I do not recommend aging mead in plastic. If you have a plastic bucket or a plastic fermenter, something like that, there's a chance that there's some plasticky flavors or oxygen that gets in through the plastic. So what I recommend you do is use glass. It's expensive, but it will save you some heartache. And when you age mead, don't let there be a lot of oxygen on top of the mead itself. So let's say you have a gallon of mead and the top of your carboy is like three inches of air. Over time, that air is going to oxygenate the brew. You'll notice it might turn a little brown and get a little gross looking because that's oxygen entering it. It affects the flavor. It will make it taste kind of cardboardy and wet, like wet cardboard, it's gross. So less headspace. This kind of takes me to one point. When you make your brews, it's best to go over the end goal volume. Meaning if you wanna make one total gallon of mead, you need to go to 1.2 gallons. Because when you move it out of a container into another one, you lose some mead in the process. So it just guarantees you'll have some buffer there. That might mean that you have to use a bucket for the primary fermentation or a larger vessel, but that's okay. Don't age with a lot of headspace and leave it in a dark, controlled temperature area for as long as you want and can be patient. Mead doesn't have to be uh, aged for an eternity to be good, unless it's something that's like super high ABV. Our final topic is oaking mead. One of the most interesting and fun things to do with mead because it's so, it so greatly changes the flavor of mead when you do it well. There are tons of ways to oak mead. You can use chips, you can use cubes, you can use spirals, you can use uh, barrels, you can use staves. I think those are all my options here. All of these options are things you add into the brew. Let's say you made your mead, 
it's in a gallon container, and you're like, I wanna add some oak. Well, there's a lot of different oak varietals. There is, generally speaking, a light, medium, and heavy toast oak in most varietals. There's stuff like American, French, um, Hungarian, there's Amberana, there's all of these wild kinds of oaks that come in different forms. You kind of have to decide, well, do I want something light? Do I want something really heavy toast? Whatever you can get. You pick the form, let's say it's chips. You can add those chips into the brew. And what I do for my oaked meads is I taste them periodically. I go through and it's just kind of fun to see what's happening. I'll get a little sample of the mead and just see how the oak is imparting. Some oaks take a long time. What's interesting about this is oak cubes and oak chips, you'd think even if they're the same varietals, come from the same tree, they take different amounts of time for the oak to actually impart the flavor. So what's important here is that you taste test your brew. I'm not gonna give you a number to say, only oak your mead for eight weeks because that could be very wrong. I've had oak that's moved really fast. I've had it move really slow, tasting your brew. But picking your oak kind, whatever you got, Generally, you wanna pick the like varietal of oak. I wanna use French oak, and I wanna go medium toast, okay? Now, I can only get these in, let's say, chips. So I have my medium toast French oak chips, and then I look, generally on the container, it will say how much to add per gallon, and you could add it that way. Sometimes I'll go overboard with mine and just taste test it a lot, and take a guesstimate of how much I put in there. But add your oak, taste it, let it sit for as long as you want, and then when you're ready, rack it into a new container off the oak, and you can continue to age it for as long as you want. If you're using a barrel, barrels often take a long time to impart because there's a lot of surface area around there. I did a whole video on like different forms of oak and mead, and had some fun with that video, so I'll put that down in the description as well. But regardless, oaking mead is really fun. It adds some cool flavors. It really kind of flips, it's like a ball. It flips the flavor profile of a brew depending on what you've done to it. It also makes it feel more fancy. That's just kind of fun. I hope that this has helped. Today we covered a couple different topics. We, talked, we covered back sweetening mead, carbonating mead, aging mead, and oaking mead. In 401, we go deeper. I kind of go deeper with the back sweetening topic of how to back sweeten a mead without using a stabilizer or anything like that. So if you want to know how to do that, there are other ways to back sweeten, including non-fermentable sugars. We talk about capping out the yeast. That's some stuff in 401. And there are a lot of other deeper topics. Those topics are there to help you be a better mead maker. And I'm hopeful that whatever knowledge you're gleaning from this will just go into your brewing. One of the most important things I've learned through my mead making process, and I'm 404 brews deep into my mead world. I've learned that experience is the only thing that's really gonna teach you. You could watch these videos 17,000 times, but until you try it, you're never really gonna know if it worked or why it worked. So go experiment, go see what you can do. Check out the links below. And if you like this stuff, go ahead and hit like on all those things and it just supports the channel. Um, check out 401, 501, and I hope you have a fantastic day. Cheers.